Welcome into the Ether, a podcast brought to you by ETHUB, the essential source for Ethereum information. Don't let high gas costs keep you out of Ethereum. On Balancer, you can trade all you want and receive gas costs back in your wallet. With their new Bow for Gas campaign, traders are receiving six figures worth of Bow tokens every week. With deep liquidity and great prices on trades, this is a no-brainer in my opinion to check out. Balancer V2 is also just around the corner with some exciting new features. These include bringing stable and weighted pools under a single protocol along with flash loans, lending via asset managers, and much more. It really is becoming the one-stop shop for DeFi liquidity. Head over to balancer.finance to check it out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the ETHUB Weekly Recap. In these episodes, we discuss the latest news from the Ethereum ecosystem and crypto space as a whole. This week, we are covering the news from June 14th to June 20th, 2021. Hey, Anthony, want to walk us through the news? Hey, Eric. Well, what a volatile week in the markets. Hey, ETH is not looking too hot right now. Crypto markets in general are not really looking too hot right now, but that's okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're still long-term investors, right? <laughs> anyway, I think uh, other than the price uh, kind of like action of the week, you know, a lot happened. And one thing that I wanted to talk about before we jumped into all the news was the fact that uh, Gitcoin Grants uh, Round 10 is now live. So, you know, we've spoken about Gitcoin grants a lot on the on the podcast before and how you can donate to all of your favorite projects on there uh, and that can be quadratically matched. So yeah, I wanted to extend a big thank you to everyone who's donated to ethub's gitcoin grant so far uh we, we obviously really really appreciate it um and if you haven't done so uh and then you wanted to you can just find a link to that in the newsletter um but i think you know don't just donate to ethub of course donate to all the projects i think that you regularly use or want to support on gitcoin and one thing that i think people should be doing is kind of scrolling through and looking for underrated projects or projects that aren't getting that much attention because you know i think i I've, I've long held the belief that gitcoin grants is amazing but it's also a popularity contest where the most well-known uh, projects are going to get the most uh, donations right and, and then subsequently the most matching and the most kind of funds allocated to them. Now, popularity of a project is obviously going to correlate to how many people are using it. Uh, and there's different civil resistant mechanisms in place to kind of like prevent people from gaming the system as well, which is pretty cool. But generally, I think that there are a lot of projects out there that are doing a lot of good work and they're just behind the scenes. So people may be using them, but not actually know that they're using them. So there's a few like developer libraries on there that people, you know, that, that developers obviously use and people are getting a lot of um, use out of that because they're using the smart contracts that were built using those tools, but they just don't know about them because of the fact that uh, they're, they're, you know, it's in the background. So yeah, I encourage people to go have a look at that uh, and, you know, go, go see uh, newer projects and projects they may not have thought of donating to before and see what you can find there. You know, there's a bunch of collections on there now on Gitcoin that you can check out too. So yeah, highly recommend uh, going and doing that. Um, and yeah, just donating what you can to, to whatever projects that you kind of come across there. Yeah, no, for sure. And we've talked about this a lot in the past with Gitcoin grants. It's definitely one of the bigger problems. I guess now maybe like the token holders can help figure this out or something. Now that they have a token, I don't know how that's going to work. But um, curation of the grants from the side of, you know, display, making sure you're displaying grants that aren't like a scam or whatever or, or worthless projects that are like fake. That's one issue. And then, yeah, displaying them has always been a huge challenge because we're, I mean, like Gitcoin grants, like one, two, three rounds. Um, there weren't that many projects, right? Like, I don't even know if there were like a hundred in the early rounds and now there's hundreds, maybe thousands. Um, I haven't really checked lately. Um, but it's hard to like sort through and like know where to go. Right. And that like the checkout process has gotten better over time, which helps. But I think that, you know, I've said this a few times, I, I something's going to have to happen with these grants where it's more like fewer teams get more money. So I'm not convinced that a thousand teams getting two hundred dollars is better than two hundred teams getting a thousand dollars, right? There, there's a point where it's kind of like, okay, that was nice, we got this money, but is it really helpful? You know what I mean? So it, it'll be interesting to see if that's like maybe an approach in the future that Gitcoin does or tries to take. And maybe it's like every other round, somehow there's like voting done or like the ten or twenty projects that should get all the money, and then the round it's smaller. Um, but then yeah, it becomes a popularity contest. It's it's a tough problem, right? But there is a point where it's like, okay, 
we got a two hundred and twenty dollars or something. It's nice, but like that's not going to help us pay for an engineer on our team or like even server for like a month, right? So um, a lot of interesting challenges for Gitcoin going ahead. But I mean, it's funny that grants has become such a staple in the Ethereum ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I totally agree there. I think if I mean the original kind of point, I guess, of Gitcoin grants and and kind of persists to this day is that it should be a way for like open source developers uh, or open source like anything to get funding and yeah of course if if the funds are too spread out then then no one kind of um i guess no handful of projects will get the right funding and things like that um but yeah i mean it's it's definitely not the the perfect system yet and it's been iterated on on each round and i think it's getting getting better as time goes on and it's funny because like in some of the rounds it was sorted, like the grants were sorted a, a, a certain way. And then when you change the sorting, it would actually change like the outcome and, you know, the, 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 and like who people donated to. And this is funny because this, this happens a lot in the Web2 world where uh, social media apps will basically, you know, or just websites in general, like, um, you know, depending on where you place things, will um, people will kind of like be more likely to click it. So that's why a lot of the, you know, the, the, the things that you want people to pay attention to on a website, you place on like the very first page and you place it what, uh, what's called above the fold. So you place it on like the the top of the page where people first see it and that's like a just a really um easy way to get people to look at it but if you were to change that right and and say you place like the button like the call to action button of your website just below the fold you would actually see like a material drop off in the amount of people that clicked on that so same thing with gitcoin grants like depending on how you default order the grants list will will kind of like dictate you know which projects get get what amount of funding and things like that so yeah going to be an interesting thing to, to work through there and see how the web two and web three worlds kind of collide there all right on to the news from the week so i guess this is a bit a bunch of news that came out uh the, i guess last week and the week before around china and china's like massive crackdown on crypto now you know you might be thinking oh wow that sounds familiar like we've, we've had that this before you know it's always been fud unfortunately this time it has not been fud it is very very real so the china crypto crackdown isn't just for bitcoin mining they've also cracked down on exchanges especially leverage uh leverage trading on exchanges which i think we've mentioned before where we said that we don't imagine like you know every government in the world keeping leverage trading going especially because uh you know for, at least for retail investors because it's just it just leads to so much wreckage <laughs> at the end of the day um but yeah the mining ban's pretty a pretty big deal because uh, a lot of the the miners are moving overseas now a lot of them are shutting down uh you know a lot of them have to get out of china and by kind of like cutting off those fiat on ramps as well they're cutting off a lot of the potential money supply. So I think what we're seeing in the, or at least fresh money coming into crypto. So I, I think what we're seeing in the markets right now is we're seeing like a, a bull and bear battle that maybe is not like, maybe generally people aren't bearish, but they're forced to sell. Like in China, I think a lot of uh, miners have been forced to sell. A lot of people generally have been, you know, because they've cut off the new money flow it's very hard for things to go up. But then you have the the West, which like, you know, the US, Europe, all that, which is still seems to be bullish. Like, I mean, obviously my Twitter feed is very curated towards the West. I, I, I don't really have like that much of a, a view into China, but like everyone that I kind of like can see, or at least most people are still pretty bullish on things. So I think maybe what we're seeing is that an east sell off and a west buy up but you know the, the sell off is is pretty extreme because of the the fact that it's such a huge crackdown on such a huge population i mean china is not a small kind of country there's 1.5 billion kind of like uh people there last time i checked or something like that so you know by cutting off that you cut off like a, a massive uh kind of like tap uh f for the crypto markets but yeah i mean i i think just short term to medium term it's going to be bearish because of that but long term i think is is fine i mean unless you start seeing more and more governments around the world do this do this kind of major crackdown. I don't see this happening in the West. Like I I, I couldn't I couldn't see like any any um a, the US doing this like clamping down like this and banning kind of like mining and just outright doing all this kind of uh kind of stuff that China's doing and you know Europe. I mean maybe some countries in Europe do it. Europe's a big kind of like place, but generally I, I just don't see this happening there but still i mean i i think i mentioned a couple of weeks ago or something that we've entered the geopolitical era of of crypto now because we saw the el salvador stuff come along um and now we have china cracking down you know just because we're entering the geopolitical arena doesn't mean it's all going to be positive there's probably going to be more negatives than positives because at the end of the day crypto was created to take on governments and nation states and their ability to print money they're not just going to sit idly by and just let that happen like that's just not happening and i always thought that was a bit of of a delusion from Bitcoin maximalists who said, oh, China can't ban this because if they do, they'll they'll cede power to the US. It's like, guys, like 
China don't give a shit. Like <laughs> they're gonna do what they're gonna do, and you know, uh, maybe maybe you're right. Event- maybe maybe they are right, and eventually, you know, um, uh, they they lose out because they they kind of like uh, I guess banned crypto or whatever. But I don't know. Uh, that's the I think the jury's still out on that. But yeah, Eric, I'm, I'm curious to get your side here. Yeah, I mean, USD is still king, right? And I think we'll be for a long time to go. I don't really see Bitcoin taking that spot. Um, maybe something like ETH, but then even then, we like USD stable coins are dominant on Ethereum as well. So that it's an interesting, you know, long term discussion there. But um, yeah, the China thing's funny, right? Like this goes back to, I mean, when I first got into crypto, I mean, people were talking about China bans and like exchanges going offline and stuff like that. So this has been going for many years. Um, but it's really this this does feel like the band-aid pull off right like there's videos of you know miners having to shut their rigs down and and um like rigs being sold really cheap versus what they would have normally gone for and being shipped out uh mining rigs that is and definitely cracks downs on exchanges it, this seems like the real one right so um you know what does this mean i mean it's important right i don't think it could definitely agree it's important and can't just be shrugged off i mean like you said china is a huge country i mean it's probably like a fourth of all the bid probably in bitcoin and the crypto space as far as on exchanges and people buying and selling so um that's it's big like it's going to be interesting to see yeah maybe that's creating a lot of sell pressure right now but what does the buy pressure how does that hurt from you know China being basically taken offline, not from just mining and using Bitcoin and crypto, but um, from buying and selling it as well. So, yeah, the geopolitical thing is going to be rocky, right? I mean, we're definitely going to enter the stage of that and regulations inside the U.S. too, right? Like governments are slow to react and they're not going to let this stuff just go unregulated, right? So it might take years just because politicians are generally older and behind the times and don't know how to react to this stuff. Unfortunately, that means they'll probably try to put down smothering regulation at first just because they don't fully understand it. Maybe we see that on stable coins eventually in the U.S. Uh, I've seen some buzzing about that for, God, what seems two years now or something. Um, But that's not all bad, right? Like there is, I mean, you and I aren't fans of regulation, but there are some small benefits. Like it gives it legitimacy, right? So as long as countries like the U.S. and Australia and, you know, and the EU and stuff like that, as long as those areas are friendly to it and not just outright banning it like China did, which I really doubt they would, right? There's very different um, political ideologies between the Chinese government and, say, the United States government um, when it comes to this kind of stuff, um, currencies and financial freedoms and whatnot. But um, there will be a day where this feels threatening to governments, right? Especially as things like DeFi build out. Like I was never a believer that Bitcoin was going to be a challenge for governments because, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a store of value gold meme, right? That can be kind of shut down super easy because everything's done through fiat on and off ramps. And not to say that doesn't happen for Ethereum as well, but there is an element to Ethereum where you could on ramp and theoretically pretty much to stay exclusively on DeFi and even use mixers and all that stuff um, and kind of just live your life in DeFi. Um, now, of course, you still have to like eventually kind of catch that stuff, but there are ways, and especially as privacy solutions come online, the, that you could get away with this pretty untraced. So, um, regulation geopolitical environment is definitely a big narrative over the coming five or 10 years because we're we're in the mainstream route now i don't think there's any denying that um and now governments will pretty much be forced to have to react to that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah i mean uh, and you mentioned like regulations i think you know generally we're not we're not fans of it i think maybe the better way to put it is that we're not fans of like over regulation because unfortunately as much as i would love to believe that the mark the free market solves all the problems i don't believe it does i think that you know there are there are there are problems out there that humans just can't control themselves over like you know uh, people speculating with leverage on these just absolute shit scams and getting falling into traps like you know this is why financial regulations exist in the traditional finance or a lot of them at least is because people just can't control themselves and i'm not going to say that i can control myself and that you know and i mean either of us like you know we, we've made mistakes in the past and and sure we fall into traps sometimes too but i think just generally when you give like retail traders like new to this ecosystem 100 times leverage on just like complete you know shit coins for lack of a better term it just you know that, that that's the, that's the kind of stuff that invites the regulation to start right because 
retail is always going to go crying to daddy government when they lose money. Um, they're going to go crying to someone. They, 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 they want someone to make them whole, whether that be through some kind of regulation or whether that be in some other way. So uh, from, from kind of like that perspective, I mean, I, I can see it. And it, it does work. Like, I mean, it does stifle the people who want to do this. But if the people who want to do it are like a minority, then for the majority, it does work by, by kind of like locking them out here. But again, I, I, I'm not really a big fan of it because I just hate like you know, government being in my life too much. Like generally, I, I would like less government in my life, uh, especially when it comes to, you know, regulating what I can and can't do. And especially when it comes to financial markets, because I believe that having an open financial mar- system generally is a much, uh, is a much bigger net positive than, than, uh, than kind of like the negatives, because you give everyone kind of like this level playing field and you don't just, uh, I guess, like make one group, uh, you know, the priority over another. We saw that obviously with, uh, you know, I guess like traditional finance, finance over the past whatever it is like you can say 100 years especially in the u.s where there's definitely you know groups that have been favored by these regulations and and some of them even write these regulations so that's why i think that i i kind of push back against it but i i can't blame governments for shutting down like this leverage trading that's been going on because it's just absolutely insane for for uneducated retail investors to just be throwing money like this away but at the same time you know how about you regulate gambling the same way governments (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's funny how that doesn't occur. Right. But I mean, fully agree with you. It's like when the one bad kid in class would ruin it for everyone else or like on the team and then you had to run laps because of the one kid that <laughs> yeah. screwed up or did something bad. Right. Like we all pay for people, you know, who bought in Dogecoin version 30, whatever fork and, you know, lost their their mortgage or whatever. And all of a sudden things get regulated. Unfortunately, that's just how things work. Yep, exactly. Uh, unfortunately, but anyway, we'll move on to the project updates from the week now. So, some exciting updates for London: uh, the hard fork or the network upgrade that's going to be including EIP one five five nine. The test nets have been detailed, so they'll be going live, I believe, on the twenty fourth of June onto Robston. I think the thirty first, or like a week later onto Gurley, and then a week later onto uh, I think Covan or another test net that I'm I'm forgetting the name of right now. Um, but uh, a Rinkeby, Rinkeby on July 7th. So, uh, and then a mainnet date has not been set yet. So th- this is obviously the final stage before we can get it onto mainnet. If the, if the test nets go fine, I'm expecting a late July, early August deployment to mainnet here. Um, unfortunately, you know, we didn't get the July 14th date that, that was originally kind of like, I guess, slotted, but that wasn't ever a date that was given as like a set date. It was a tentative like target date. And, you know, if we missed it, it wasn't, wasn't a big deal. And I still don't think it's a big deal. I mean, as we've said, like what's another two, three weeks to wait for 1559 after waiting so long? especially during this market. I don't think that 1559 going live is going to do anything for the price of ETH in the short to medium term, especially given like the current sentiment out there and, and the current kind of like market we're in. But but the thing is, is that Ethereum always optimizes for the long term, right? Because when we do upgrades, we don't think, oh, okay, we've, well, we've got to get this upgrade in because it's a bull market and it needs to happen so that we capture all the value here. No, when Ethereum kind of like does upgrades, it doesn't kind of tune them based on the market. It will just do it um, as safely and securely as possible. And I'm very glad that... um that that's being stuck to. I, I don't want to see a world where the Ethereum protocol rushes things through just to to, to kind of like meet markets and meet market demand or whatever. Because uh, I, I guess like how some people would say, well, you know, Ethereum is like a public company and and the Ethereum network should serve uh, ETH the asset as like a, and should, should, should serve ETH holders. It's like, okay, well it does, but over the longer term, it's not gonna <clears throat> basically try to time markets or whatever. That's just not the game that we're in here. So yeah, I, I'm glad to see that, that you know, these dates haven't been kind of like, you know, never, were never like kind of, I guess, like prioritized to be faster just for the, for the market action. Um, but yeah, generally another thing on 1559 is people saying, oh, well, gas fees are cheap. You know, it, we're not going to burn much ETH anyway. It's like, guys, like it's cheap now. It's not going to be cheap forever because the market is not going to be quiet forever. And even when the, <clears throat> the funny thing is, even when market volatility just picks up by a little bit, the gas prices spike back up like instantly. I mean, it was 10 guay a couple of days ago, and then we had this volatility in the market, and gas prices are now at like 60 or something for, for, for rapid transactions, or even 80, I'm just seeing here. So um, yeah, I, I just think it's a bit like, uh, a bit silly to think that uh, gas prices are going to stay low, low forever. And I mean, the only the only way that would stay low forever and keep trending down is if Ethereum actually kind of like died, <laughs> which obviously we don't think is going to happen. So um 
um, yeah. But anyway, uh, Eric, uh, yeah, your, your thoughts here, I guess, like on the dates and, and the, the meaning of 1559. Yeah, well, I've put my Twitter on ice until this launches. Um, I thought, you know, honestly, I just wanted a little bit of break with things opening up in the U.S. and having a new baby and wanting to enjoy summer a little bit. But um, so I figured it'd be a good thing me maybe to come back for right um there's been at least i i've i've put a lot of work into this you've put a lot of work into helping push 1559 through with educating about it and just you know us getting the word out there um it seems a fitting thing for me to pop back on twitter eventually with so i guess these dates are fairly important for me when it comes to that although i'm not really minding the break right now um hopefully this doesn't get like a weird one year delay or something and i turn into like you with when you couldn't tweet until i forget what the price was <laughs> at this point what the, old, the old the old all time, time high around. it was like 1400 or whatever yeah, right, yeah. Right. so funny man that feels like five years ago at this point that's funny uh, <laughs> yeah, <it does. laughs> uh, but yeah no it's just good to see like um eth1 upgrades happening right like the fact that there were even just having like minor little pushbacks to like july early august instead of like oh we've been delayed eight months or something like that right uh it's really good to see the eth1 teams i mean they've been crushing it pushing things along and like we said this is going to be one of the biggest moments in ethereum's history um i agree with you I think short term, it's not going to do much for price. I, I think it, that aspect is priced in, right? Like there's an aspect to, I see a lot of people say all the time, oh, you think price is going to go down even with X, Y, and Z happening. And a lot of that is priced in, right? It's hard to really know, but like people know 1559 is coming. Now, what we don't know is the real impact of the burnt ETH, right? So currently we, we all know we're oversupplying to miners. We're not burning any ETH for transaction fees. This is going to change now, and that dynamic is very hard to model, right? Um, what kind of impact is this going to have? It's going to relieve a lot of sell pressure, and it's going to burn a lot of ETH forever, shrink the supply. How will that impact price? And I don't think we'll really know that for a good amount of time, maybe a year or two years, to be honest. Um, and even then, it's hard to like price, right? Because you're, you're kind of coupling it with all this other stuff, right? Like the China ban, for instance, right now, and, and just the general bull and bear cycle of the market. So I don't really expect like the, the block to activate 1559 and we pump. I, I don't see that at all. Um, but long term, I mean, this is one, this is probably the most, well, besides like supply reductions that we've done in the past, this has to be the most bullish thing that's actually like gone in the protocol itself, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then and this is the thing, right? We have we have one five five nine. We have uh, the merge, you know, happening too, which I think will be bigger than one five five nine, obviously. Um, and then we have like all the other stuff still happening on Ethereum. I don't know. Like, it's just funny when I look at all the fundamental stuff and and kind of like I can't be bearish. I mean, at the moment, I I feel like we're kind of like back in maybe 2019, and we're talking on on like the podcast, and we're we're going on about how 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 can you be bearish given like everything that's coming? Like, short term is whatever, but long term is going to be fine. Um, and I think you know we we were obviously right back then, and I think now's the same kind of thing. It's like short term. I mean, we've all been here. Like for for long term listeners of Ethub, I know we have a lot of new listeners, but for the long term listeners, you've been here with us before. For, you know, we, we, you know how we kind of look at these things, you know, it, 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 there was a lot of things that actually a lot of groundwork that got laid during the last bear market that definitely didn't kind of affect the the price of ETH until later on where people started kind of pointing to it and being like, oh, wow, DeFi is actually a, a huge thing now. It's like, well, okay, DeFi, um, the, the foundations were laid during the bear market, guys, like, <laughs> you know, the only reason you can use these things is because of, of the building in the bear market. So, you know, if we do go into another long drawn out one here, which the jury is still out on, I believe, but we'll see, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think that it's that we're going to kind of like, um, you know, have bearishness on the fundamental side. There's so many, so many more teams now. Everyone's funded. I think it's going to be great going forward on that front as well. Aave is my favorite way to lend and borrow crypto on Ethereum. A true cornerstone of DeFi, Aave allows for a non-custodial way to earn interest on your crypto or to borrow assets of your choice. Building on top of their extremely successful V1, the recent launch of V2 has brought powerful features such as collateral swaps, credit delegation, improvements to flash loans, and much more. There is no doubt in my mind that DeFi is the future of finance, and Aave is continuously a leader in making that a reality. Head over to Aave.com to get started. That's A-A-V-E.com.
The Grid Plus Lattice is changing the way users interact with Ethereum applications by revolutionizing the hardware wallet experience. The Lattice is your single signing hub for all Ethereum accounts, allowing you to quickly switch between pin protected safe card wallets. On top of that, it features a large touchscreen that gives you the ability to see exactly what you're signing before you submit a transaction. No more hitting send and hoping for the best. I've had the pleasure of using a Lattice over the past few months and it's become my favorite way to manage my accounts and interact with my favorite DeFi applications. It's clear to me that this is the future of interacting with Ethereum. Head over to gridplus.io to get started. All right, on to the next update. So Maker has detailed a new feature that they're implementing called Flash Minting. So it's a Flash Mint module, they're calling it. What this allows Maker to do is basically issue Flash loans uh, for up to 500 million in DAI. So the way this would work is that essentially, uh, the way people do Flash loans now is that they borrow uh, DAI from like Aave or, or I think DYDX had this and there's some other platforms that have this. Um, and they're, But they're only able to borrow the amount that is available in the liquidity pool. Whereas because Maker is the one that actually issues this die, they're able to uh, mint, and 500 million, I believe, is just like a, a, an initial limit they've put on. They could theoretically um, flash mint any amount of die as long as it's paid back in the same block, like a normal flash loan here, because they are obviously the issuers of die here, and it would tra it would be treated as if it was. Um, real die by the market. So I think this is really, really cool because one, it brings another revenue source to Maker because I'm sure they're going to charge a fee for people to do this. And two, it fixes a lot of the um, the issues around kind of like the liquidity that people will face when they're doing flash loans because like, oh, I can only do a flash loan of this size because the liquidity is only there for this size. Um, and, you know, what's this mean for, for the other flash loan platforms? Like, I think it's going to be fine because they offer more than just die. Maker can only offer die flash minting for now. Um, I mean, maybe not even for now, for like the foreseeable future, because they, because the only reason why they can do that is because that Maker is the issuer of Dai. They're not the issuer of any other asset. Whereas Aave and, and other Flash uh, um, loan uh, enabled platforms allow you to do this with, I think, any asset. So you can do it with like ETH or like other stable coins or other kind of like assets. So I think they're going to be fine. But in terms of like the Dai use case, it would probably be a no-brainer just to use Maker um, for your Dai needs, especially because I imagine they, they they might undercut on the fees here to try and like get some get some kind of uh, action there and I, I think going forward it's going to be cool to see how many people use maker uh, uh makers die flash minting instead of just using flash loans through something like Aave or, or something like that um so yeah really cool to see uh maker getting into the flash loan game here yeah for sure like if if you're a protocol that has the potential to tap into deep liquidity it seems like a no-brainer right and and this is something that we've talked about recently in competition breeding innovation and kind of pushing teams to all of a sudden we have like competing DeFi protocols right and underneath there in the long run token holders are going to want a cut of some some um like sushi swap for example like sushi holders get a cut of protocol fees a lot of teams haven't quite implemented yet or i guess token holders haven't quite implemented yet uh uniswap would be one example but in the long run we're going to have token holders wanting a cut of protocol fees and that means that there's going to be a big push to you know implement new features maybe something that's worked for another team that's bringing in um you know profits like like you said to take out a flash loan they're probably going to charge for this like Aave does, right? Um, so eventually, though, what's good about that for the users, too, is there'll be a race to the bottom on fees. So say all of a sudden, I don't know what Aave charges for flash loans. Well, let's just make it up and say they charge five basis points or whatever, um, which is 0.05%. Um, they, let's say they... Now, Maker comes in and does a little less. Ave might have to respond to that, right? So there might be this competition, and that's good for the users at the end of the day. And I think we're really going to see this on DEXs, which is actually, not to sidetrack here, what's really interesting is, I don't know if people have realized, but the ETH USD trading on Uniswap V3 has now been pushed to the 0.05% fee pool instead of the 0.3% pool. That's because of the capital efficiency of V3, and people will be able to type set tighter ranges, um, they can make more in fees because of those tighter ranges and Uniswap automatically routes uh, to certain pools based on what the best trade is. So traders are getting a 
you know, 15%, they're paying 15% of what they used to um, on ETUSD trades on Uniswap, which is awesome. So a bit of a sidetrack there, but it kind of goes with my narrative. Of, I think fees are going to get pushed low over time. Um, you know, token holders aren't going to want to push them too low because that's going to be like the source of revenue for these holders. Um, but it's cool just to see like DeFi teams still innovating, right? And like, a lot of these teams are like flush with cash, right? And like, I'm not totally sold on fully decentralized governance yet and token holders being able to push things like this through. So it's good to see that teams are still like working and implementing features, right? And it makes sense. I, everyone kind of knows DeFi is the future. So you're going to want one of the staple protocols. Um, but yeah, nice to see this and have different options. I'm not personally writing any flash loan things, but uh, good for people that are. Yeah, yeah, I'm not using any flash loans, that's for sure. Uh, I don't really have anything that I would use them for, but there are obviously a lot of people that do. They've been very popular in the past. You know, I think that people maybe know flash loans because of a lot of the exploits that have happened where flash loans, I guess, make it easier to exploit things. And you know what? I actually think that's a positive because what it does is it just battle tests these systems much faster than we could have uh, because, you know, no one's really risking any capital here because, you know, if, for those who don't know how flash loans work, it essentially allows you to borrow any any amount of an asset as long as you pay it back within the same ethereum block so you can borrow a billion dollars worth of die or whatever and go do something with it on chain and then as long as you pay that back within the the same ethereum block uh, the, 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 um, the transaction will execute. If you don't pay back that full amount, the entire transaction will fail. So anything you did with that 1 billion die will fail. So I actually think that this is really cool because it means that literally anyone out there can do an economic exploit on any protocol um, from anywhere in the world without having the, to have a, a capital requirement, for, for instance. And this means that, you know, the top security researchers um, or at least someone who's like, found a bug can can attempt to exploit it themselves if they want or they can report it to kind of like the team if they the, the, the teams if they want and the teams can do it on their own like a, a white hack kind of thing here so i think the, the it's a net positive for the ecosystem and generally if something has been exploited with a flash loan then it could have been exploited with a, without a flash loan it just took the person with the right amount of capital which will eventually come along anyway so you know this kind of stuff where people say oh this couldn't have happened if flash loans weren't available it, it could. If flash loans just uh, enable the people that were, aren't rich to be able to do it. But if someone's rich and they want to do it, they'll do it. I mean, look up George Soros and what he did to the, I think the British pound or something like that, um, or one of the one of the fiat currencies. He basically shorted that 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 stuff and and basically made it lose its peg because he had the money to do so. Now, um, you know, uh, if there was a flash loan there, you know, any of us could have done that if we wanted to, but he had the money to do it. So I think it just democratizes kind of like access to capital, which. I believe is always a pretty uh, a good thing. All right, on to the next update here. So we had the graph uh, and optimism teaming up. So the graph, as everyone knows, is a, is a middleware protocol that uh, it basically serves different queries to different DeFi apps. So whenever you go onto something like Zappa or one of your favorite DeFi front ends, pretty much everything that you see on there is powered by the graph in terms of like the uh, the the dollar number you see on the on the assets and the APY numbers and everything like that uh, is is powered by the graph's querying engine. So um, this this is kind of the infrastructure. Uh, and the critical infrastructure that's needed for blockchains and for layer twos as well. Now, obviously, Ethereum has the graph and like Infura and Alchemy and, and Etherscan and all this sort of stuff, but Optimism didn't. And this, I think, is the main reason Optimism was delayed in March until July was because they didn't have any of this infrastructure out there. They didn't have their Etherscan block explorer, which they do now, like Opti Optimism Scan or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they didn't have uh, the graph. Obviously, they do now. They didn't have uh, Alchemy or Infura, I believe, but I think they do now. And like um, they obviously had like the wallet infrastructure with MetaMask, but that wasn't enough. You can't bootstrap a new kind of like layer two ecosystem without this critical infrastructure in place. And, you know, we've seen Arbitrum doing this over the past couple of months. They, they haven't launched yet because they're still trying to get this infrastructure in place. And even things like Oracle's count here, like Chainlink, you know, Arbitrum has been supporting Chainlink for a while. Optimism has as well. But that's that's critical too, because you can't have DeFi without Oracle's. Uh, you know, Aave couldn't exist on layer two without Chainlink, for example. Same with Compound now, um, and and Maker couldn't exist on on Layer Two without their own oracles being on there as well. So taking all that together uh, is why I guess like Optimism 
was delayed back in March. And, you know, in hindsight, it was a pretty obvious delay coming up because they had, yeah, they had not like brought out any announcements like this. They had not say they had not said that they were getting support from these sorts of teams. So generally, I think that, um, you know, when you see the these layer twos coming online and if they don't have this infrastructure in place yet, you can be safe to say that they're going to delay their launch or they're not going to be launched for quite a while because, um you know, I, I don't think any of these solutions want to launch without uh, these, this infrastructure in place now because they'll just lose out to their competition, so to speak. So, yeah, still cool to see this. Uh, the graph is obviously amazing. And I, I just, you know, at this point, I think over the next three months, we're going to see so many L2s go live in a public way. You know, Arbitrum, hopefully Optimism goes live next month. Hopefully, hopefully they don't delay again. And I think even ZK Sync's uh, mainnet is, mainnet, maybe even testnet is due for August. So the next three months in Layer 2 land is going to be pretty fun. Yeah, mix that with 1559 and eventually the merge. Um, it'll be a fun second half of this year. Um, but yeah, this is great. I mean, we've talked a lot about, at least I've worried about the potential UX of Layer 2. And I'm very happy to see teams realizing that it's not even worth really launching until this essential infrastructure is in play, right? We talked a lot about uh, Polygon launching uh, an Etherscan fork, and that makes that network way more enjoyable right and i i personally feel a lot more comfortable using it um metamask makes things easy but you still want to like see things and what's funny is like when we first started talking about layer two years ago d5 wasn't what it we, we kind of knew like the vision of d5 and eventually what it could be but we didn't have it yet so a lot of like layer two talk i mean especially really early on was just all about like payments right um maybe some of the weird web three visions that existed back in the day but really it was just like payments paying people payment channels. Um, and that doesn't really require much infrastructure, right? So this was never really a consideration early on. And now you you need a lot of things visually in DeFi to like trace transactions and really see what's going on. Um, and the essential parts that are obvious, well, obviously MetaMask um, or the wallet of your choice, I suppose. But I think we all know <laughs> MetaMask is kind of that one at this point. Um, and then you definitely need something like Ether. You need Ether Scan period, not something like it. Um, and then, yeah, you need these other essential tools. Like the graph's definitely one of them. Um, I don't know if people realize how often they're using this, like poking around DeFi. But for example, if you go to like uniswap.info, right? Uh, and you're kind of like analyzing a market and seeing the trades and the liquidity, um, that's querying the graph. So there's a lot of things that you're kind of doing visually that potentially you don't realize that it's using this in the back end. But if you were to go to your favorite layer two and you're used to this user experience and all of a sudden uniswap.info is not there, um, it's going to feel weird. It's not going to feel the same. So it's essential to do this stuff. I'm really glad teams are doing this up front. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, for sure. And yeah, I mean, yeah, you mentioned Polygon with like their their Polygon scan and things like that. I mean, we've, we've spoken about this before, how we think that like Etherscan has like this amazing moat now where they just build these block explorers for these other networks. And then at the end of the day, like all these kind of, you know, layer one and layer two networks are going to have their, their, the same infrastructure and it's just going to be up to users and developers to pick where they want to go. I think developers actually have the most power here because they're not going to deploy their apps to like every every kind of chain or if they do they're going to deploy like older versions to one and newer versions to the other and i think we've spoken about this before as well where you kind of like view um this ecosystem from a developer mindset and developers aren't going to maintain their apps on like 20 different chains that's just not going to happen uh it's not easy to do that because anytime they want to upgrade they're going to have to upgrade it on 20 different things they're going to have to kind of like there's there's no, there's kind of like um little little differences between the, the networks as well so i do think it's just going to be a handful uh and and really, it's just going to be a developer and user race to see which one of these things succeed over the long term. All right, on to the last project update. So FutureSwap, haven't heard about this for quite a while. Um, you know, this was big a few months ago, but basically they announced that their V3 is coming soon um, and, it, and they detailed it in this blog post. It'll be launching natively on Arbitrum's Layer 2, which is very interesting. I'm going to get back to that in a sec, uh, but it also includes a completely redesigned protocol with more leverage and assets to trade as well. So for those who don't know, FutureSwap is basically a derivative exchange. Um, and I think that they've redesigned and and and, and are launching natively, natively on Layer 2 two because they've seen the success of DYDX. Now, 
I want to um talk about this this kind of like thing of launching natively on layer two and not launching on layer one. I think this is the future because what's the point of launching on layer one now when there's layer two solutions available? Because it re in, in reality, the long term is for everyone to sit at layer two anyway. So why would you even try to build a network effect on layer one for your app? You wouldn't because if, if, if layer two is giving you what you want, if everyone else is at layer two, because it look it's looking like there's going to be a lot of people on Arbitrum, um, you know, Polygon already has like an amazing ecosystem as well. So if everyone else is sitting at these kind of like um, scaling solutions, then there really is no point launching on layer one. And this is why I've, I've been saying, you know, I think we've both been saying it for a long time now that we believe layer one is just literally going to be a chain for um, uh, liquidity pools and whales to sit on and for layer uh, layer two proofs to be, to be kind of like... Um, uh, transacted on. Uh, anything else is just going to be at layer two. And that's fine. That's exactly how Ethereum has been designed. Ethereum has not been designed as a layer one scaling ecosystem. We're not relying on layer one scalability to kind of reach the world. So I I'm really excited to see more and more projects just launch natively on layer two and kind of say, well, you know, we understand the long-term roadmap of Ethereum here. We understand that layer two is the future. Let's just focus all our energy there. And this, you know, goes back to what I was just saying about how, you know, developers don't have the capacity to support like you know 20 different networks they're going to support a handful of them and you know i think the less that they have to support the better because it means that they can f uh, be laser focused on their product instead of having to you know change things or tweak things or worry about different networks that's always been my bear case for the multi-chain thesis is that it just for developers it is a nightmare for them to have to maintain code and their apps and not just the code but like everything on like a million different networks i i, I and keep it up to date and keep it up to like the, the latest and greatest i think that we've seen this play out in the web 2 world where developers really hate the fact that they have to support like all these different browsers and normally you'll just have the the, the main ones supported like chrome and and uh, and uh, Safari and and you know Edge and things like that, but 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 generally the actually a fun fact with the with the web uh, with the, uh, the web browser kind of ecosystem is that a lot of them speak the same language because the, the the language is like HTML and CSS like and things like that and and like there's different web kits and things like they all speak very similar languages and, and that, that 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 kind of makes me think of like if um all these kind of like ethereum forks like polygon uh, not polygon sorry uh, but all these evm compatible things like bsc and, and things like that and phantom i think and and hobby eco chain or something um they're, they're the kind of same kind of thing here is where they all use these similar kind of language because they know that people are developers uh don't want to you know, rebuild their stuff from scratch. They want to use what they're used to. That's not to say the future can't be brighter where, where developers use different tools and they'll be building things from scratch. I know Starkware has their own smart contract language called Cairo and they have their own virtual machine. And as I said, DYDX is, is, is big on there already. And there's a, there's a few other things like uh, Mutable X and stuff like that. Uh, but generally, you know, keeping it, you know, uh, I guess like uh, uniform for developers is, is the way to go because um, it just makes their lives much easier, I, I believe. Yeah, this is super interesting, right? Like a native layer two. I, I guess in all this talk we've done about this, I never really pictured this, but it makes total sense, right? I mean, and really, so first of all, it's going to be really weird to have like apps that like you couldn't see and use on layer one. You have to go to layer two. Like it just seems like they should start at layer one too. But from their perspective, from like future swap and developers, yeah, like why would they start on layer one, right? If they know most of their users are gonna be more interested in the layer two solution. And I think where we really kind of like saw these ideas kind of come about is seeing things like BSC, right? And basically like retail and a lot of retail users and a lot of users on Ethereum that are just priced out of gas fees, they, they didn't even care about giving up decentralization, right? They wanted to just go trade these shit coins at low fees. Now, the beauty of like Arbitrum, where FutureSwap is going to launch, is you aren't giving up those. You are. It isn't a centralized solution, right? You're not giving up those guarantees that Ethereum can offer you because everything's settled back to layer one. So it's kind of the best of both worlds, right? And I, I think this totally makes sense. This also goes to what you've been preaching a lot is hopefully exchanges, which are still the you know the fiat on and on off ramp for all of Ethereum, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> 
I hope they integrate these well, right? Because we still want retail users to come in and get used to DeFi through these layer two solutions. It'll be important for them to be able to easily go cash and then straight into these solutions. And there's going to be a few of them. So hopefully that UX is smooth on the exchange side as well. But this is cool. Uh, I'm excited to see this. And I'm still just like really anxious to see, you know, I, I think multiple layer twos are going to end up winning. Um, there's a lot of strong competitors out there. Over time, maybe a longer time frame, we consolidate to one. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to watch. Yeah, definitely. I think that whole kind of layer two ecosystem is like an, an, at the next frontier generally. And it's going to be interesting to watch like how that all plays out over, you know, the coming year or two. I think we're going to see a lot coming out of that, especially, you know, if the, if the market stays quiet, it'll be really cool to focus on like, um, you know, what products are actually getting traction and usage without a hot market. Because as I've said before, um, I believe that bull markets give teams a false sense of security where they believe that their app is like, you know, on top of the world just because people are using it during like a bull market to extract some sort of value out of it. But it's really the bear markets and, and kind of like the down markets where you see the best apps come out and and people use what they actually want to use and not just use it because of um, they're getting money to use it basically. All right, last thing here was a, a few blog posts uh, that Vitalik put out around vertical trees and state expiry and statelessness. So uh, for those who have never heard of uh, this before, there is a tweet in the Ethub newsletter from Justin LaRue, a tweet thread where he gives a TLDR on what this is all about. Uh, essentially, vertical trees allow for some great uh, efficiency gains within Ethereum, uh, and and that allows for uh, the statelessness roadmap to to be executed on. Now, I'll I'll describe what statelessness is. Basically, Ethereum has a state which keeps track of basically everything on Ethereum, say like account balances and things like that, as an example. So this state is actually the bottleneck, I think, of the Ethereum blockchain in terms of um allowing us to scale further, like raising the gas limit on layer one, and, and, and it's a bottleneck for node syncing too. So what if we could actually do a thing where we had a stateless Ethereum, where in order to basically keep track of all this sort of stuff, you would need to provide, uh, I guess, like a proof that you wanted access to this, this information. So uh, for example, say that you have like a balance of ETH on your account and you don't touch that that account for like five years. Well, why does that need to, 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 to remain in the active state for five years if you haven't touched it? So the idea would be that you would have this kind of witness. It, I think it's called a witness that, you know, five years down the line, you would come back and, and pre present this witness and that it would reactivate your account essentially. So basically, um, I think after a year, your account would go into like a dormant status where your, your ETH is going to still be there. Your ETH not going anywhere. But to access it, you would need to provide this witness and that would reactivate your account on, on the network essentially. And this would be done, uh, as I said, to, in order to kind of like make layer one more scalable here and make it like just easier to sync a node and things like that. Now, this isn't anywhere close to being implemented. I think this would come after even sharding, I believe. Maybe it could come before it, but I don't know. It's still a very um, open kind of research and development thing going on here. And there's still kind of trade-offs as well, because you might be thinking, well... You know, if this is the the case, then wouldn't like the uh wouldn't kind of like everyone need to have this witness? And then if you lose your witness, what happens to your account and things like that? Well, I imagine there's going to be you know third party services as well out there that keep a tra keep track of this sort of stuff and keep witnesses for everything and are able to supply it for you. I think that there's centralization concerns around that, and rightfully so. But you know, this can be built into wallets. Wallets can literally just have like a backup of your your witness on your PC. Like MetaMask can just put it on your PC. Um, Ledger, for example, or a hardware wallet can basically put it on their internal storage. So I think generally um, for most users, it's going to be fine. Um, and this, but this also applies to, to developers and to code on, on the chain and things like that, where, uh, you know, they're going to have to supply witnesses for old state as well. If you want to access old state of like a project or something, you would have to supply a witness. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that plays out it's still very very early days but if you want to read more about it justin larue's tweet thread is in the in the newsletter here but yeah eric i mean this has been on the cards like for ages in ethereum right the stateless roadmap yeah for, i mean it seems like almost since the beginning right and this becomes interesting in eth2 as well of course um and justin i i it's kind of funny <clears throat> i feel like maybe this was a response subtly to me retweeting vital because i said i'm going to act like i understand this and like an hour later justin did a great breakdown <laughs> yeah. in thread. <laughs> yeah yeah i think uh, so yeah so it might have been a little subtle uh, tweet at me but it's a great thread um it helped me a lot kind of visualize it and put it together so definitely go read it and you put it together well so i won't recap it but yeah i mean this is vitally important just to the future of ethereum right like we can't allow state size to get too large we can't allow it to 
because if we let it get too large, people can't download it. All of a sudden, that becomes centralized. Like this is the whole problem, right? With like EOS and BSC and stuff like this. That like they aren't thinking about these long term it problems, right? And one thing I love about the Ethereum space is we try things and we say, hey, you know, if that's not perfect, let's move on and try something new, right? And that seems to be what you know we're just iterating basically when it comes to this research on the state size side. That's hard to say, state size side. Um, and we saw this with E2, right? Like at a point, the whole E2 roadmap got kind of squashed and rewritten. And so it's cool to see this research still happening. I mean, uh, still like thank God for Vitalik, right? The guy's just a genius. He's a great. I mean, it, what's funny is he stepping stepped back so much from like a, a leadership role of Ethereum. Like early on, people just looked to him for everything, and I think he's done a good job stepping back there. But I mean, he still puts out the most important research, right? I mean, like it was his paper that led to one five five nine, right? And the amount of like good quality research that this guy pumps out um, that's vital to the future of Ethereum is, you know, is great. And it's it's cool to see someone. You know, he rose to fame and fortune fast, right? And he's kept his head on straight and he's still just down to earth and, and still working on the protocol. So um, I just wanted to say big props to him and thank God he's still around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for sure. It, it's just, it really always amazes me just how much Vitalik is able to do. I mean, not just within Ethereum, but generally. And I'm not just going to like be like gushing over Vitalik here, but honestly, like he is someone that I, I really do look look up to in life, even though he's younger than me, which is a bit odd to say, like I look up to someone that's younger than me, but he, he just like handles himself very well. I mean, I listened to his podcast on on uh, Lex Friedman's podcast um, and it was just amazing. Like he he isn't just like into Ethereum, he's, he's across so many different things. Like, as you said, like there's politics and then um, he, he he knows like so many different languages as well. I mean, the, the guy, I don't know how he finds the time to do all of it, but it's just, just incredible. So yeah, very, very happy that he's still, you know, part of the Ethereum ecosystem, and I'm very happy that he had the foresight to just take a step back and and let the um the ecosystem develop on its own instead of trying to control everything. Because I at, at the end of the day, I don't think Vitalik actually wants control of anything, and and that can't be said for most other crypto project founders, I believe. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Awesome, awesome. All right, well, that's it for this week, everyone. So thank you again for listening. You can subscribe to the newsletter at ethub.substack.com. The podcast is at podcast.ethub.io, and we'll catch you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to Into the Ether. You can subscribe to the podcast and newsletter at ethub.substack.com, find our website at ethub.io, and follow us on Twitter at, at econoar and at sassel0x.